we're looking here and we're looking here for signs of trouble. First blush. It, and it's real hard right now because we know that the system itself is so goofy. Like even just look over the nose, you can see the shape doesn't exactly follow, but it doesn't mm -hmm. seem to be quite as bad. We still got the same mm -hmm. little bit of bounce down here, mm -hmm. but we may not be able to fix it that way. On the Spintron, we want to try some other stuff. And what we're going to do is we want to swap some springs around. Well, the problem is when you go to a different spring, the retainer has to fit the spring properly. So, you know, when you look in here, the retainer's got steps on the bottom. So the diameter of those steps have to be properly matched to the inside diameter of these springs. Otherwise, it's not doing its job the way that we want it to, okay? So when we change to a different spring and we gotta use a different retainer to fit that spring, we have to be careful about the installed heights and things like that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the retainers, I'm gonna turn them upside down. I'm gonna measure from the surface to this first step. So make sure that's zero. I'm gonna turn the retainer upside down. I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna measure that step is right about a hundred thousandths. Okay, so we're gonna call that step as a hundred. Now I'm gonna take the retainer that we took off of the engine and measure it. And again, I'm zero, and that one's 106. So there's about a five or six thousandths of an inch difference in height there. That's probably not enough to get worried about, but what we're gonna be interested in is what we call the installed height of the valve, which is the distance when it's in, we put this thing in and we compress the spring and we put this guy on and we put our locks in there. The difference from the bottom of the spring to the bottom of our retainer. That height under compression that we're holding the valve at is gonna set how much load or how much force there is against the valve when it's closed or what we call on the seat, okay? Then as we add lift and we compress that spring, that load's gonna go up by what's called the spring rate. So if my spring has a rate of 500 pounds per inch and I have a half an inch of lift, I'm gonna see an extra 250 pounds in addition to what I had on the seat. That would be my open load or over the nose load, okay? But in order for all that to work right, we also have to be aware of the fact that the way that the lock system works is we have these, these are called locks, they have a groove in them that matches the groove in the valve stem and you can see that the locks are tapered. So there's a cone shape inside my retainer that matches the cone shape of my lock. So that spring is now pushing force up trying to pull this apart and it can't do it. I have in my hand a gauge ball that's 9 16 of an inch in diameter. So that ball is bigger than the hole at the bottom of my retainer but smaller than the hole at the top. So if I drop the ball in the retainer it doesn't go all the way in, but now I can come over to my gauge and I can measure from the top of the retainer to the top of the ball and get a number. If I put this ball in the other retainer and if it sits lower or higher, that's gonna change the point where my locks fit and it's gonna change my installed height. I can see that my 916 ball sits at 62. So if I grab my other retainer and do the same thing, come over here, I'm gonna zero off the top of my retainer come over here to my ball, and it's 73, about 10 thousandths of an inch different there. So we had about uh, five or six thousandths of an inch different on the thickness of the step, and we have about 10 thousandths difference of the cone, but we're gonna be in the ballpark. It won't take us a lot of shim to get close to having the same installed height, but that's a really important check to be making when you get new retainers. Put your ball in there, make sure all your retainers are at the same gauge height. Putting the head back on, you know, try some new valve springs. And we'll lighten up on it and see what happens. Look at the valve lift, it doesn't move at all now. Yeah. We still have loss from the deflection, but we literally cut it in half. It was losing 12 degrees before, 
Now it's 284 to the worst is 277. It's beautiful though. Look how smooth it is. Hey, We're looking at the Sorcerer's engine here and we just ran another test run here and have the laser beam looking at the exhaust valve. Essentially it's inside the engine as you recall looking up the bottom of the exhaust valve and Ben can measure it within a thousandth of an inch and he's got a, a sophisticated software program where he can plot it out and it makes more sense for eyes to see. And if you look at the purple, hopefully you can see the difference. That's the way the camshaft are designed. That's the original lobe design. Ben's going to overlay is the yellow, which is actually happening in the engine as we go. And you can see, I think the ideal thing is if we can copy or overlay, if you get your valve train overlay and follow the purple as it's intended by the camshaft design, that's the ultimate. And what we've done by lowering the spring pressure and choosing a different style of spring, and Ben can explain what that was, that that changed, but but we have never to this point in the last few runs at least here yeah. where everything is smoothed out and Ben's going to explain to you what is smoothing out here and why it's happening but this is a really big development for for us and it was because of the spring change. Go ahead yeah. Ben, lay it on so, the line. So a couple things, the biggest thing that we wanted to change initially was we wanted to stop all the bending and deflection of your valve train, right? We knew from the beginning, from the first day we met when I was in Vegas, the system is not holding the rocker arms stiff enough to the cylinder head so when the push rod goes up and it tries to make the valve open, instead something in the system just bends or flex. So that's a loss of lift that we get initially. However, as we go throughout the lift curve then, whatever we did by bending that is gonna come back with a vengeance like a, like a diving board. And so what it was doing before is it was tossing it way up over the nose and giving us, we call it the McDonald's, right? Like these really wobbly lines. Then it would come over here and crash. It would bounce off the seat, you know? So what we did first to try to, we, we don't have any tools yet to fix the, the weakness of the lack of stiffness in the system. So we can't make the system like stronger yet. So what we did was we took the approach of that, if that's the case, let's use less force and not bend it so much in the first place. So we took about a hundred and, uh, what did we take out? About 150 or 125 pounds of valve spring pressure yes. on the seat. And we took about 45 grams of mass out of the spring. We went from a triple spring to a double spring. Our new spring has a smaller wire diameter, which makes the spring uh, have a higher natural resonant frequency that it wobbles and vibrates at. And also took a ton of actual pressure or load off of the valve when it's on the seat. So that means when the rocker arm comes around and begins to try to open against that spring force, it's got 150 less pounds of spring force trying to bend everything, which don't forget is multiplied by your rocker ratio, right? So if I got a thousand pound valve spring and I got a two to one rocker arm, that means my push rod's feeling 2000 pounds. So yours are not two to one, they're 1 1.75 to one. But what it means is we got a huge benefit from taking that 140 or 50 pounds off of the opening side multiplied by the rocker ratio, then multiplied again by the rate of acceleration we're trying to move the valve. So we were looking at that the other day. What we just proved was we took all that force out of the system and the engine responded amazingly. Like I, I actually shouted at the end of the run there because I, I was so blown away by how much better it is. Now we can see that both in this blue line and this green line. So before this green line is the duration that's being measured. We started out before, and by the time we got to the end, we were losing about 12 degrees of duration out of our camshaft. So if you started with you know, 285, you'd end up with 272 or three or something like that. Just this one simple change has cut that in half. We're now only losing about four or five degrees of duration, which is normal. We're gonna lose something. Mm -hmm. We'll never get this line to be perfect like this one because we're not gonna have an infinite, infinitely stiff system. What we're trying to do is contain it enough so that the diving board doesn't pitch it way over off in, into the graveyard. You know, in, in my opinion, this is a system where at 8,500 RPM, there is zero detectable valve bounce. We're not crashing it up here. If we were in desperate measures and we needed to, we could go race that right now, but it's gonna get so much better by the time we're done. Yes, <laughs> and so he's talking about the tools is some of the stuff it will be changed in here is our stiffness how we're holding all this hardware under the head. Uh, the push rods are gonna make play into this thing. There's a lot of different things that we're talking about. We're gonna change the material and the size of the push rods, both the, the uh, wall thickness and the diameter of the push rods to make the, especially the exhaust push rod way stiffer. That's the family, the Manton family, right? That's correct. Then Jessel is helping us design new rocker stands that will tie everything down and anchor it onto the head better. 
we may change the rocker ratio to give us more or less stiffness. So what happens is when our rocker arm ratio goes down, in order to do that, my pivot length has to stay the same. So I gotta anchor it here and my valve's still here. I can't change the length of this side. So in order for my rocker arm ratio to get lower, my tail shaft length has to get longer which means it gets less stiff. We could, for example, decide to change the amount of lift at our camshaft lobe and lower that, making our, our base circle on the camshaft bigger and stiffer, mm -hmm. and then shorten this up to increase the rocker arm ratio so that we get back to the same lift at the valve, and making this shorter will make the rocker stiffer as well. So we have a lot of options and tools here to work with, as well as we can change the geometry and the shape and the material. We can make this out of steel, we could try you know, different amounts of, you know, how much we scallop here and where we add stiffness and where we take weight away. We have a lot of things left to do and try on this thing. So we got Jessel helping us on all that. The push rod change that we're gonna make. We got the shape of the, you know, how aggressively we're trying to make that stuff open. And we have not even yet begun to improve this system and we're already making huge strides. The coolest thing is now, so the first time that Ben picks up the phone and talks to Comp Cam, he has real data and he can yep. send them files and listen, this is what happens when we change it to this, we change that. They're gonna be eager to find out how we change the spring pressure and what it did and how it reacted to it. So they can design the right kind of a ramp speed and, and, and lobe separations and, and whatever we're trying to accomplish here. Another person we don't wanna forget about is ARP. ARP Absolutely. is designing us some hardware in here so we can stiffen things up and we've always utilized that ARP fasteners, but they're also been working. And this all started seven months ago in Vegas when we were out there running. And we initially right there gave them the go ahead to say, hey, we want to work with you. And since then, they've already been working behind the scenes waiting for data. And we told them, we just don't want you to pick something off your shelf. We're going to give you some real data. Mm -hmm. And we waited for all these months and we got into the Spintron and that's exactly what we're doing. We're going to give them real data. So we're going to be doing some more back to back here so that we can give them the direction on how things react to this. They're going to be able to pinpoint what exactly we need for a product then, right? Absolutely. So that's what, what happens is when we start making data driven decisions rather than emotionally or opinion based decisions, we're going to have a lot less wasted time of stuff that we tried and didn't work. We're gonna have a lot less wasted money and more importantly, a lot less wasted runs, right? Nothing's worse than we put all this effort in, you get one shot to go down the track and you get to 400 feet and it kicks a rocker off or a head gasket fails or whatever. That's so, all, that, we're all stuck in that. That's, yep. that's just the way we're always, we've always learned it that way. That's right. And so what's happened is because it's always kind of happened that way, it's become acceptable that that's just the way it goes. Well. I don't think that those 40 NASCAR engines that go out there every Sunday morning and they run 9,800 RPM for four hours and not a single one of them blows up, I don't think that's an accident. And so what we're doing is we're applying those tactics and those lessons so that we can get a little bit farther in that direction. You know, we don't have to go four hours, but man, if we could go four seconds, that'd be great, right? With that, I'm gonna fast forward one more layer here. We've never talked about this yet. When we have the new products from all these manufacturers show up here in the shiny new boxes, and they're designed and built by calculation from our data here, we're going to meet up again here in Lake Havasu at EFI University. And we're going to be, I'm sure you're gonna be as eager as we are, but we're gonna come right back in here in the same room and we're gonna put it right on here and we're gonna watch the real data, how how did we do? What was the choices like and what we came up with? Did it fix, did it get us where we wanted to be? So. We're excited now, we're gonna be just as excited in I, I near think, future. I think what's crazy about this is the what used to be Team Sorceress almost doesn't exist anymore. No. Like the, the evolution that has happened in the last year mm. of the design and development of the engine, what you've been doing on the car side of things. We got all new equipment for us to team up with Shane Tecklenburg to do the engine calibration with the cylinder combustion analysis that's never been able to been done before. I mean, we have the greatest EFI tuner on the planet, in my opinion. We have the greatest assembly of people working on, you know, we got Jessel, we got ARP, we got, you know, Com EFI University, we got your your guys at Com Team Source, you got Comp Cams. Like, you literally couldn't have a better dream team to say, look, we got a program that's good. We don't want to come back out and do a program that's great. Yes. Well, that's well that's said. That's exciting. Yep. So now what are we going to do next, Ben? So I think if some is good, more is better, right? So okay. I, I wanted to prove a point that we could take the load off the spring and it would improve things. I, I'll be honest, it improved it way more than I thought it would, which tells me we're going in the right direction. The fact that we've now gained 700 useful RPM of the engine. What I mean by that is before, 
we had a distinct change at 7,800 RPM, which also corresponded to where the engine sort of misbehaved out on the racetrack. Yes. Now we have virtually no change all the way up through the highest we went was 8,500 because before it was unthinkable to go higher than that. It didn't even sound right. It sounds like it's a song now you can just let it play out. You like a NASCAR out engine. Out. Exactly. Right. Yes. Yeah. They, they don't feel like they should shut them off at ever, you no. know. And now it's, I, I hear that sweetness in the tone yep. out of that room. Now it's like, oh, that just sounds great. Just leave it there. I feel like if, if some is good, more is better. We should take some more load off the spring. I okay. think we ought to turn the RPMs up a little bit more. And okay. I, I think we ought to find. Well, stay tuned. We're going to do that. How do we know where the edge is if we don't go out and find it? Yeah, let's go find an edge. <laughs> okay, guys. So we just made a run. Uh, we're looking at the exhaust valve. We took some spring pressure off of it and a different design of spring. And um, just as Ben thought, what it was going to happen was going to uh, soften the things up, get rid of the 72 to 7800 RPM flatness that was happening through the harmonics of the valve springs that were on there. What we're going to do now is we're going to take a little bit more spring out of it because there's a shim underneath the exhaust valve on this, so it's going to hopefully lower another 25 to 40 pounds, hopefully. So it's another step in the right direction. When we do this stuff, we have the data so we can incrementally look at how much it changes things. So when we choose a new valve spring, we should be able to hit the nail right on the head and say, this is exactly what would be perfect for this, for our application and, and we're about to learn. And also what we're gonna do is we're gonna run a little bit higher in the next run. We're gonna see what 9,000's like because at times we can run it out the door without the lockup on it. And we'll be getting close to 9,000 before Big Ed lets out of it. So. Uh, we do need to know where it's at and uh, and see what happens. I'd rather have it done here and sit on the track and have a surprise. Just like a NASCAR engine. Yeah. Is that four hours? <laughs> <laughs> Another good guess. How can you keep getting this lucky? Look at your look at your loss of duration. The blue, the green line. Wow. Yeah. A lot of this is just was in the spring. Uh huh. 